everybody, it's Fresco Kinos. Uh, this is module two. So um, the idea is we're thinking about our integrated marketing communication strategy. And a lot of it is planning with a kind of strategic plan, obviously, and analyzing data that we have about our prospective market and target audience and competitors, um, the environment, all those kind of things, and then uh, formulating a marketing plan that will um, get our message through and actually get our product into the hands of the consumers. So um, this outlines that a little bit, you know, the idea of um, looking for an opportunity, of comparing the market, and then how we're going to actually, you know, do our market strategy. So let's take a more detailed look here. So our strategic plan or our marketing plan is an important part of the process before we actually, you know, start spending a lot of money advertising or designing websites and things like that. We want to make sure we know who we're targeting and our objectives for that targeting. So the idea might be here to think about, well, what is our, you know, budgetary resources? Um, what is our um, kind of organizational values and then what segment of the market we're actually targeting. So thinking about things like opportunity analysis, this is the idea that um, we could find, you know, interesting trends like maybe it's, you know, or organic or uh, natural um, or the idea of um, Here's, you know, uh, an example from the book, the milk processor education program saw a opportunity for sports drinks saying that milk or chocolate milk was a way to kind of bounce back from your workout. I don't know if I agree with that, but um, the idea is that um, they were looking at this as a kind of uh, opportunity way to get their product out there. Um, another example that I put up there was the idea of selling masks. Now, obviously, when the pandemic hit, um, you know, the mask market was, you know, reserved to certain people who did it for sports or um, travel or mountain climbing or whatever. But then all of a sudden, everybody needed a mask. So, I mean, there's an opportunity there that you can get right in there. Um, the other thing is competitor analysis, right? So, I mean, let's say I've got a new company called Fashion Burgers. Well, what I want to do is look at the market and say, gee, who else is out there selling burgers? Ever hear of McDonald's or Burger King? Yeah, they're there, okay? So, um, why would I need to get into this market? Is it, you know, worth it for me to get into this market? Um, maybe if I'm just a local burger place, I could think, well, geographically, I'm going to be selling, you know, great quality burgers just in my neighborhood, and that may work fine. Um, but if I want to go national, I got to think about, you know, these big competitors that are out there. So what's going to be different about my burger? Maybe it's going to be better quality. Maybe again, it's going to be organic. It's going to be like Bear Burger, right? If you know Bear Burger, uh, where you know they use grass-fed or organic meat. Um, is my customer service better? What's going to bring customers, you know, to my location instead of going to Burger King and McDonald's? Maybe it's cheaper, right? Maybe um, it's just great advertising that catches people and brings them in. Um, so related to this then is to think about who my audience is, right? So who they are demographically. So this means things like um, their age, their sex, their education, um, how much is their income, uh, their race, their ethnicity, and then where they are. Maybe again, geographically, are they in my local neighborhood? Are they uh, global? Um, how am I going to reach them, right? So maybe, you know, are they on social media? Um, how am I going to appeal to this certain audience? And, um, you know, think about what is their online behavior, their online profile, so that I can actually target them. And I may have more than one target audience. Okay, so this is the idea then of uh, really kind of choosing that target market. And uh, let's think about how we're going to do that. We're going to go um, and kind of go into this in a little bit more depth here and identifying the target market 
and uh, you know thinking about selecting one or more segment to the market you know maybe I'm doing something like um, bottled water so this is pretty wide you know I mean everybody drinks water so it might be you know something that's very kind of but then if I get into things like flavored bottled water or you know uh, something like uh, uh, pre-mixed something you know I might be starting to narrow that funnel down where um, you know my target audience is becoming more and more specific so let's look at some of those strategies um, there might be one that's geographic and again using McDonald's as a um, kind of sample here the idea is that you know McDonald's is all over the globe and uh, if you go into a McDonald's in uh, China or in India or in Japan, you're going to find different selections than you would in uh, your local McDonald's. In fact, I was in Maine uh, last year and the McDonald's has lobster rolls, of course, because there's lots of lobster in Maine and everybody likes lobster. They go to Maine for lobster. So McDonald's picks up on this geographically and says, OK, here we have, you know, the McLobster or whatever it was. Um, so then the other thing is demographics. So talking about what we, you know, just mentioned the idea of targeting people based on age, sex, you know, uh, education. In this case, I'm looking really at, uh, income. So there's a Timex watch, which may cost a hundred bucks. And then there's a Rolex watch, which may start somewhere at a thousand bucks or you know, it'd be even more than that, right? So you know, we're targeting a different demographic segment with those two, and obviously our advertising, our marketing channels of communication are gonna be targeted to that audience. Um, the one on the bottom, which is a little obscured here by my webcam, is the idea of psychographics, and this is more like your personality, your lifestyle, you know, your interests and hobbies and activities. So maybe you're a fitness buff or maybe you're an older person or you have a disability or whatever it is that, you know, makes you very unique. That is where, again, it's up to the marketer to think about how they're going to target someone who is in that unique psychographic profile. Um, I might use a magazine like ARP, right? So here, you know, this magazine obviously appeals to people who are above 50. When you're above 50, they ask you to join, you know, so if you have the magazine, um, you can expect that inside that magazine, the advertisers are not going to be advertising things like, uh, skateboard say you know it's going to be more you know maybe uh cars right so the idea that you know the people that you're advertising to is a certain niche of the population okay so here's another way to kind of segment the market and that might be in behavioral which is what we kind of just talked about the idea of behavioral uh and i want to talk a little bit about this 80 20 rule um but also benefits right um, and here's an older ad from Volvo. So uh, Volvo actually repositioned and changed their uh, strategy a little bit. But back in the day, they were like the safe car. So they didn't care that it looked a little boxy, but the idea was it did really well in a crash test. Um, so it held up really well. And people who were, you know, conscious of that and looking for that benefit um, would go towards that uh, product, right? They would say, you know, I'll spend the money for a Volvo because I know that in case I get into an accident, I'm going to be more likely to be safe in a Volvo. So the benefit was safety. Um, here's this idea of the 80-20 rule. I threw this slide in just to kind of think about, you know, I, so you guys would understand that. The idea that 80% um, of your sales volume is generated by 20% of your customers. 80% of your revenue is from 20% of your products. 80% of your complaints are from 20% of your customers. So this is a mathematical rule that um, originated, you know, from math, not from marketing, but it actually applies pretty well uh, to most marketing situations. Okay, so uh, continuing with the idea of segmenting and kind of really focusing and narrowing in, we've got the magnifying glass there, we're analyzing our target market data. Um, where are we gonna get this data from? So there are lots of data services, right, that will gather data and um, then kind of um, analyze that data and use algorithms to uh, spit out, you know, kind of forecasts and preferences about that data that will help marketers to target their market. 
So, um, you know, think about uh, maybe you're on YouTube and uh, all of a sudden a survey comes up. And it says something like, uh, are you more likely to visit one of these retailers? You know, Ace Hardware, Home Depot, blah, blah, blah. So where do you think this data is going? You know, so the idea is that um, this data is being compiled to help marketers better target their consumers. And uh, here's a, a chart from Nielsen where they look at kind of households in a cluster profile and um, you know arrive at certain things like you know who's in the household where are they located what are they interested in what are they more likely to be susceptible to uh, buy in a kind of advertisement or persuasion um, target marketing right the idea of um, this is an interesting one I'm using cars again here um, so we have an undifferentiated market right in 1906 Henry Ford came out with the Model T. Could have been a little, couple of years later. Somewhere in that range though, right? The Model T, it was like $400, which was a fortune in those days, right? Uh, but the idea was that that was it. It was the Model T. Uh, it only came in black. You know, it was there was just one. You wanted one, you didn't want one. You couldn't have it, you know, in red or, you know, a convertible or, well, you know, different options, whatever. It was what it was. It was the Model T. So there are a lot of marketers who have that one product that might be universal and um, that's it. They just, you know, work on kind of sending that one product out to the entire uh, population, the entire globe even, and, um, you know, letting people focus on that. But then again, there's the idea that we want to differentiate, right? So, uh, you know, any color you like. Obviously, everyone has different preferences. You have a car company like Toyota, but they also own a company called Lexus, right? So you might, you know, have the lower end Toyotas. Not that they're really low end, but the idea is that if you want to go the next level up, it's Lexus, but it's also owned and manufactured by Toyota, right? So we have this differentiated market now in, in this Toyota example where um, some people might um, go for the luxury version, some people might go for the more utilitarian version. And then uh, the last one is a Bugatti, which is, you know, something like, you know, a few million dollars. So that car is obviously marketed to a very specific kind of segment of the market. And this is what's called concentrated marketing. So we're only looking at a certain, you know, target market that in this case is very exclusive. But it doesn't have to be exclusive. It might be something like, you know, left-handed tennis players or something. I'm just joking. But um, you get the idea, right? So um, how else are we going to kind of select this market? We're going to examine lots of data. So we might look at, you know, the sales potential of this particular segment. So a certain segment is growing. Um, you know, people are, you know, aging or people are more younger people are coming or more tourists are coming, travelers, whatever it is that, you know, the market is changing, that segment is changing. So there might be more opportunities for growth. Things like, you know, the pandemic. Obviously, there were opportunities for growth in the pandemic. I talked about masks. There might be other things like, say, you know, uh, herbal supplements, antivirals, things like that. Drug companies, obviously, vaccines. You know, there's all kinds of things in there. So I think, you know, there was uh, Johnson & Johnson and then there was Moderna, you know. So, um there is some type of uh, market available and, you know, both of them can coexist. Um, so they can actually compete with each other and uh, still be successful. Does that make sense? I hope so. <laughs> okay, so the next thing is a fairly large uh, kind of concept. And again, I'm trying to distill it down for you guys with these lectures, but the idea of positioning. So positioning focuses again on a certain consumer and, um, you know, it, it's related to the, the segment. Again, um, here's another car example, right? So we can position our car based on a couple of different categories. One might be economy. So I've got a Toyota Tercel there. 
you know, nice little car, doesn't cost that much, does really good on gas, pretty easy to maintain, not a lot of bells and whistles, right? Uh, but you might want to say, gee, you know, I want to drive around in a more prestigious uh, luxury Cadillac with a nicer ride. I don't care about it being a little bit more of a gas guzzler. And, um, you know, the interior is nice. Uh, my friends are going to love it. They'll be all envious. Uh, has a nicer set of options and all those kind of things. Or I may want to appeal to a market segment that is worried about performance. So in this case, we're looking at uh, a Porsche, right? Or a BMW, you know, the driving machine, the ultimate driving machine. So this is the car that, you know, I can kind of go around corners and, uh, you know, have real control, rack and pinion steering and all those things that really make it kind of, you know, and we talked about the Volvo, right? Being, you know, the other uh, thing was safety, right? So what else can you think about? in, in uh, cars. Maybe it's environmental. You want to get an electric car today, right? So there's lots of different ways to kind of position yourself in the market and say, you know, you should buy my car because it's inexpensive or it's luxurious or it's safe or it's environmentally conscious or maybe it's all those things, but that might be a little bit too much too. So here I am walking in the, you know, uh, orange juice aisle and, uh, you know, it's just like all, all these orange juices are there. And I'm like, gee, which one should I get? My wife says to me, you know, grab an orange juice. And I'm like, okay, which one do you want? You know, is it the uh, pulp free or the organic or the Valencia? You know, so again, the idea of what's going to set your brand apart from all of the sea of competitors that are out there and uh, help that consumer make that purchase decision. So, you know, maybe it's the fact that it is organic or it might be, you know, the packaging. You know, I like to buy my juice in glass as opposed to plastic or uh, I, I want to make sure that it's easy to recycle. So I'm going to get the paper container, right? So there might be lots of different reasons that are influencing this based on the consumer's point of view um, about your product. And again, their kind of past experiences and behaviors like, gee, I'm, you know, sustainable, so I'm definitely not going to buy the one that's, you know, in the plastic container. Um, so another thing might be price, right? So, you know, this drives me crazy. Or, you know, look at these two bags, right? They're basically the same bag. You know, one is $21,000. The Laura Piana, you know, made in Italy, alligator skin. But the bottom line is that, you know, it's a one liter size bag that has a clasp that, you know, I can put my goodies in or my wife can put her goodies in. And, uh, you know, it's going to cost $21,275. On the other hand, uh, I could tell her, you know, gee, get the Madewell camera bag, which is around $100, and it pretty much does the same thing. So, but obviously there's going to be a different market here. And I picked two items that are obviously on the extreme ends of the spectrum, what we might call outliers, right? But, um, you know, again, you're going to think about how price is going to uh, factor into your uh, target marketing. And, you know, you're appealing to a certain niche, like a luxury market, or you're appealing to a general market, or, you know, somewhere in between. There's also this idea of application, right? So how am I going to use the product? Um, you know, going back to the car thing, you know, the Mazda just came out with a car that's environmentally friendly. And I think a lot of their ads are like, okay, let's, you know, drive up to the mountains and we're going camping, we're going hiking, right? So those type of populations who do that are people who might be younger and more environmentally conscious and aware. And, um, you know, so the car that they want is the one that is going to be, you know, fitting in that, you know, kind of set of um, options and, you know, have good gas mileage and be environmentally less impactful, but yet be the one that I can, you know, stow up with all my gear and have a roof rack and uh, it's got four wheel drive. I'm not going to get stuck in the mud, you know, so all those kind of things, right? So here's Arm & Hammer baking soda. I don't know. I guess it was originated to bake with because it's called baking soda, but, you know, um, I buy a box of it. I might use, you know, a tablespoon for baking. What do I do with the rest of it? Um, so, you know, Armin Hammer said, you know, gee, you know, you don't have to just bake with this. You can also use it to, you know, deodorize or clean or uh, whiten or whatever it is. So there's lots of uses for, for baking soda besides baking. 
So in a way, they kind of narrow themselves down just with the name already. I mean, they could just call it bicarbonate of soda. Uh, but uh, obviously, the name baking soda is there already. So the idea is, you know, how can you appeal to these different markets um, through advertising, through messaging, through informational, uh, you know, things on your website? You let people know, hey, gee, you know, you can unclog your drain with Arm & Hammer baking soda. Okay, here's another one. Um, this is actually from your text again, the uh, idea of California avocados. And they ask, you know, how does the Avocado Commission appeal to these, uh, m you know, markets? So if you look at the ad, it says, uh, without American grown avocados, it's just meat and a bun. So the idea might be, well, gee, you know, instead of using mayonnaise, you know, spread some avocado on your sandwich and, um, you know, use that to kind of, compete with the sauce, you know, the other sauces that are out there. Um, and then the idea that, it, of course, it is health conscious. So it might be healthier than using, say, butter or mayonnaise. Uh, another positioning strategy might be the idea of um, a cultural icon, you know, something like Tony the Tiger, right? So, uh, you know, Frosted Flakes. There's lots, you know, Kellogg's invented the Corn Flake, and, uh, but a lot of other companies make uh, these kind of cereals. But what makes, you know, a uh, consumer want to choose Frosted Flakes? You know, it might be the cartoon-like character on uh, the cover and Saturday morning cartoons and, you know, the working in the store and the kid identifies and says, gee, mom, you know, that's the one I want because um, they're great, right? Tony the Tiger. Um, or it might be, you know, comparing yourself to the competitor. I love, you know, the Mac and PC ads that were around uh, about 10 years ago where, you know, you had uh, the PC being all stuffy and, you know, uh, the guy who was the PC guy actually had a virus, right? He was coughing. And then the Mac guy was all cool and light and, you know, the idea that, you know, the Mac was more user friendly and had the, you know, cool interface and, you know, if you just look at that, you know, you've got the, this monstrous PC with the tower, and then you've got this slick looking Mac. And of course, I'm doing this lecture on a Mac, and you're probably watching it on a Mac, right? So the idea is that, you know, what made you choose to buy that Mac instead of a PC? And I'm sorry for our PC users, but, you know, and obviously these lines have changed a lot over the years where, um, you know, Mac and PC can kind of compete, you know, pretty well today they almost do the same things um, back in the day it was like you know if you wanted to do things like music or video or ph ph photography you know like when photoshop first came out it only ran on the mac so you had to have a mac to to run it and of course that would fuel sales too so tony the tiger and we've also got you know stitch the tiger right so you know here's the uh kind of mascot and the uh brand, the marketing image of the Fashion Institute of Technology. So again, it kind of, you know, uh, exemplifies this idea. Okay, so then we think about repositioning, right? We talked a little bit about Volvo. You know, they don't really have that boxy look anymore. Um, they're still pretty safe. They may mention that, but they're talking about other benefits now, like, you know, performance and, you know, just the luxury kind of ride that maybe a Volvo will give you. So here's Taco Bell. Again, I like to choose examples from the book. Um, Yo quiero Taco Bell. Like, I want Taco Bell. This was the old, you know, uh, kind of position where it was, okay, you know, you're a student you're studying you don't have a lot of money you need to you know uh, fuel up so you go to Taco Bell and I remember you know going there the first time I think a taco was you know 90 cents or something so you could have a, a you know a decent meal for a couple of dollars um, but the quality wasn't really that great right so uh, what Taco Bell did which was very positive for their marketing image was to change this or to reposition the image um, and lose that, you know, que tiero que Taco Bell, yo quiero que Taco Bell um, was, um, you know, to go with this live, ma, you know, live more, so uh, live mas, or, you know, the idea that, uh, and excuse my, my Spanish, 
um, but uh, you know, more of a lifestyle thing. So now coming out with more choices, maybe a breakfast choice or a vegetarian choice, right? One that's much more healthy, uh, fresher ingredients, all that kind of stuff, right? The idea that you know we're now kind of targeting a different segment or a, a larger segment or retargeting, repositioning uh, to kind of uh, you know breathe more life into the brand. And you know you may have seen a little change in the uh, logo, right? The logo didn't go crazy, right? It's pretty much the same thing, but it did change a little bit. You don't want to totally change that logo. Remember, the logo is a really important part of the brand identity and the image. So if you start, you know, totally changing the logo, then you kind of lose all that uh, investment and you uh, dilute the overall brand so people are like well you know what is that <laughs> so, all right so the next thing is this idea of positioning with uh, kind of symbolism so here's Quaker Oats right um, so the idea is you know it's healthy it's solid you know the Quaker kind of image in there a good hearty breakfast you know that would uh, keep you going through the whole day your busy work day and uh, you know, today it's, you know, considered also very healthy, right? Oats, lower cholesterol, and they're just good for you. So it's much better than maybe that, uh, you know, donut that you might have for breakfast, right? So have a bowl of oatmeal. Um, an another thing, I've, you know, we just mentioned branding, but the idea of this, you know, again, just thinking about, you know, your phone. Why did you choose the phone that you have? Is it because um, you're a steadfast Apple uh, user and you wouldn't go near an Android for any reason and you, you, know, you want to make sure your phone is similar to your laptop and you're going to be able to kind of move back and forth between the two operating systems and, uh, or the other idea may be like you know, you're into Android and you want to go with the Samsung. So uh, you know, what makes you choose the brand you choose? It's again, all of these things, your, your dem demographics, your um, behaviors, your lifestyle, um, you, you know, what you know. You may not know, you know if, unless you do the research, which one is best for you. Or you may just like the way it looks, right? You like the looks, you like the logo, uh, your friend uses it, it's a word of mouth thing, you were influenced by someone. There's all kinds of reasons why you would choose uh, a certain brand. And uh, But I'm obviously, you know, building that brand, and you guys will study much more of this uh, in AMC, is this idea that, uh, you know, the brand is gonna be strong against other competitors, right? And have this brand equity where I would say, gee, I'm in the market for a new computer, I'm gonna go right to Apple. Or, you know, my daughter wants a computer, I'm gonna make sure I influence her or I buy her an Apple because I know from my experience that it is the way to go, it's the best computer. Okay, another way to position might be this result of packaging, right? So my wife loves Tiffany's, I don't know why, but um, you know, the holidays just passed, I spent a lot of money on Tiffany's for her, and um, you know, she, well, as soon as she opens it, she sees that uh, iconic blue package and you know, she's in love with it. So um, this idea that uh, the package, you know, in the beginning, the package was really there to kind of protect the item, right? to you know, encapsulate it and protect it. But you know, more and more the package became part of the overall communication and the brand image. So people see that blue package and they know right away it's a you know, piece of Tiffany's jewelry. Um, you know, another way to exemplify this, this is the idea of uh, perfume. And you know, this always irks me, the idea that this perfume costs $150. The ingredients, although you know, it might have some really expensive rose oil in there, still it only has very little bit. And um, you know, the ingredients cost you know, $1.50, but the package costs a lot more and the advertising costs a lot more. So the perfume sells for $150. Um, so again, and you know, a lot of people might, you know, in the store choose it because of the package, right? It just looks so beautiful or you've got those people spraying you, you know, and there's the package and, you know, it just has a certain kind of um, mystique or an image that goes with the overall brand. So, you know, again, related to this now is this idea of price decision. So I could sell it, you know, in a plastic bottle for $1.50 
Um, but you know, that wouldn't be very appealing. So once I put it into that glass bottle and have all the advertising, now I can raise the price to $150, right? So when I get into the market with a new product, I'm also going to think about those things, right? So how am I going to make money? Obviously I can't sell it for $1.50 if the ingredients cost me $1.50 because I have to account for all the other things like packaging and advertising distribution costs and um, so the idea that, you know, I have to obviously make a profit too, um, that might be influencing, you know, what my cost is going to be the demand. So if there's a lot of people looking for it, I can sell it cheaper, right? If there's not a lot of people looking for it, I've got to have the price a little higher. What's the competition doing? And again, I could look at the competition and say, I'm going to be cheaper or I'm going to be more expensive because I've got a more quality product or maybe just a more quality image, right? Like looking back at that you know, $21,000 bag. Okay, it was made out of alligator skin, but uh, was it really worth $21,000? Um, and then again, the advertising that I put into it. I might use a very generic kind of advertising, you know, where you have, uh, say, the actual owner of the company doing a, a short on webcam, right? Or you have these, you know, guys who used to do used cars ads and they'd just be like on the lot, you know, talking about. So it was really inexpensive to produce. Or you might have this, you know, commercial that looks like it's a Hollywood movie and it costs a fortune to produce. And, uh, you know, obviously that might be the uh, Calvin Klein, you know, perfume ad or something like that. So all of these factors are going to influence how I'm going to price my product in the market. Okay, um, we're almost done here. So the idea now is how, how to get the, the thing out there, right? So we have this concept of, you know, various channels. So, you know, we talked about some of those things like, you know, do I want to advertise on radio? Do I want to advertise on television? Do I want to advertise on social media or have some kind of marketing mix, you know? So the idea is that a lot of manufacturers will market directly to the consumer, directly to the customer, you know, and uh, this is a way to kind of cut out the middleman and uh, being, you know, in close contact with their uh, consumers. Uh, another way, though, is an indirect channel where I would have a product and then I would market it to distributors and retailers like Macy's and Walmart. And, um, you know, so the idea would be that they would help, you know, in the advertising costs. So Macy's would say, hey, you know, I've got a sale on Calvin Klein this week and come in and whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, that middleman could help me, right? Um, or they could actually cut into my profits. So again, depending on how um, we're marketing, maybe it has a lot to do with, you know, I'm just entering the market, so I need that help getting the, out there, or, you know, I'm well-established and I can have people come directly to me. All right. So we're going to finish up with this idea of a promotional push and pull strategy, right? So it's related to what we just talked about, this idea that, you know, um, I want to push my new widgets into the market. So what am I going to do? I'm going to try to get uh, into a trade show where retailers might be there and they'll say, hey, gee, I really want to, you know, pick up this for my store and I think I can sell it. And um, so um, that might be one way to actually get out there with this kind of push strategy where I would market it more to the trade than directly to the consumer and have the trade then, uh, you know, help me with the advertising. Uh, another way, though, would be a pull strategy. So this would be this idea that, you know, you see the ad and then you walk into your local jeweler and say, hey, gee, do you have a, an Omega watch for sale? Um, you don't? Well, can you get me one? You know, that kind of feel. Uh, or you might, you know, get an email or a direct marketing piece, right, where, um, you know, you're, you're getting pulled in. By that, so um, you know, there's a there's an ad you know floating around on the bottom of your YouTube screen, and gee, you know that looks interesting, you know. So you're gonna click on that and then get pulled in, and uh, this is a different kind of promotional strategy where you know um, you, they're, they're kind of uh, you know trying to throw that net out and grab you. You're you're almost being more active, right, to come into this uh, strategy. Right. So you have these two, you know, kind of uh, methods you can use a little bit of each, too. But um, each one has its um, advantages and disadvantages. OK, so uh, don't forget to keep me posted and uh, let me know how the uh, reading is going and also 
um, anything else that you guys need. I'm going to keep the, uh, the other assignments light for this one. So just make sure that you take a look at uh, the reading and uh, we'll probably just do the chapter quiz. And uh, remember, send me a message saying you really enjoyed Module 2 because I am giving credit for uh, the Easter egg is what I call it. I'm putting it at the end of this one again, but I may bury it somewhere in between uh, on the next one. So enjoy and keep me posted.